Hello, Chris here from Coulter's Good Earth Farm. Have you ever thought about what it would take in order to grow enough food to feed your family during difficult times? Well, now's a great time to start thinking about that. And in fact, several years ago, I wrote a book called The Complete Guide to Survival Gardening to help you do that very thing. In that book, I detail the 12 crops that you need to focus on in order to produce enough calories to feed your family. So in today's video, we're going to look at those 12 crops, which I call the Dirty Dozen. So how did I select the Dirty Dozen? Well, I wanted crops that could be produced easily on a backyard scale using just hand tools without a lot of mechanization. So that's great for all the homesteaders, no matter how big a property you have. I also wanted crops that were easy to save seed from, that you could produce, you could propagate uh, by yourself without any outside help. So that's very important. We're talking about self-sufficiency and sustainability. I also wanted crops that bridged the seasons. So we had main season crops, but we also have crops on the shoulders and even in the winter. I also focused on crops that you could store that had a potential to be used for a long season so that we have something to eat through most of the year. Well, the very first crop and the primary crop that we should depend on as survival gardeners is corn. In North America, this makes a lot of sense because where we're at, this was a crop that the first peoples here depended on as their primary uh, field crop. So corn or maize is our number one crop of the dirty dozen. So what type of corn do we need to grow? Well, normally we grow a heirloom flint corn. Uh, we have our own variety we've been growing for several years, but it was originally a bloody butcher mixed with a couple other varieties to make a good flour corn, because that's primarily the way you're going to be using this corn is as corn meal. And you can use that to make it into a paste, a mush, or cornbread. So that's the primary uh, way we're going to prepare this corn. But the good thing about Bloody Butcher and some of these other heirloom field corns is that they can be used as a dual purpose corn. When they're just tender in the cob, you can actually use them as a roasting ear. So they make a pretty decent roasting ear at an early stage. You can go ahead and start eating them and then you can let them mature and fully dry out. They can be easily harvested by hand and stored, and then you can take out those kernels off the cob, grind those into a usable cornmeal, and then cook that cornmeal. So that's primarily the way we're going to be using corn. The other good thing about corn is that it can be used as an animal feed. So if we have some chickens, we can crack that corn, use it as an animal feed, uh, cows, pigs, uh, we can feed that to other animals. So it's a good dual purpose crop, it's also very easy to uh, plant, to cultivate, and to harvest and store, as well as process by hand. Now that's not the case for other crops such as wheat or barley or millet. Uh, some areas are going to have some of those crops, but for our area, USDA Zone 6, and this applies to probably Zone 4, 5, 7, and 8, uh, corn should be our primary crop. Now normally we do our Bloody Butcher field corn mix, but this year we have a patch of popcorn I wanted to show you. And this is another good one that we use a lot. Now this is just a yellow eared, uh, this is actually a hybrid, but you can get a, an heirloom if you want. This is a, a hybrid popcorn. The good thing about popcorn, it has all those attributes of field corn. This can be ground into a really nice uh, tasty corn meal, but you have the added benefit of being able to pop it as a snack. And we're talking about maybe you have limited food sources, you can't go to the grocery store, buy those chips or Doritos. Well, you can use corn to make uh, some nice popcorn. And if you want to grind your regular corn, you can use that to make tortillas, you can use that to make uh, tortilla chips. So there's a, a lots of different options for corn. So it's a really good dual purpose crop that you can use for a lot of different things. Now you don't want to necessarily grow both types of corn, even uh, maybe a sweet corn you want to add to the mix in the same year in the same area because they will cross pollinate. Corn cross pollinates readily. So you really want to select one type and what we do is we alternate years. So our sweet corn is at a different property, 
but uh, we have popcorn here on this farm and then one year and the next year we have our flower corn and that, that keeps our seed uh, pure and either one is a good is a good corn to have so we kind of rotate that out so we keep our seed stock going and corn seed stores a long time so that's the other good thing about this uh, this crop is that you can pull off these ears we leave them whole you can uh, store these as long as they're good and dry in sealed barrels or uh, feed sacks you can hang them up in a dry place you can put them in the basement however you want to do that uh, so they store really well so the seed will keep for several years so you can plant alternate years in order to increase your diversity of crops. Also we have the, uh, the corn shock which makes a useful animal fodder if you have animals integrated into your homestead as well. So it's, it's also good. Maybe a negative with corn is it is a high uh, nitrogen user. So it's going to need fertile soil in order to get your full yield potential. And that uh, really talks about our next crop that we're going to add to corn to sort of alleviate those problems. So the number two crop of the Dirty Dozen is the green bean. Now that makes sense and it's going to sound familiar, right? Because you have corn, you have beans, and you're going to know what number three is going to be, uh, squash, right? That's the three sisters because those have been grown in North America as staple crops for a long time. There's no need to change that. We can change up a little uh, types of varieties and, and the types we grow, but we want to stick with those as the main crops that we do grow here in our area. Now, green beans are a good versatile crop for a lot of reasons. Number one is they fix nitrogen. So they don't need a lot of fertility. And in fact, they add fertility to the soil. So they're good grown with uh, a crop like corn or in a rotation. If you use a pole bean variety, you can actually grow those together using the corn for the structure for the bean to climb up. This is actually a different type of green bean. These are the long beans. You might have heard them called uh, a yard long bean. Well, they're a different species than your normal garden bean, so these can be grown alongside your regular green beans. So they're a great option if you want more than one type of bean in your garden at the same time. Now, when people think of green beans, they normally think of a bush stringless bean. And while those are good, and you might want to add them into your rotation, they're not my number one recommendation for um, a bean to grow as a part of the Dirty Dozen. That recommendation goes to an heirloom pole bean. Now the green bean I recommend is a really dual purpose green bean. And, that, and those categories are checked with uh, a lot of heirloom beans. And that's for the reason that while they're young, uh, you can pull them and use them just like you would a snap bean. So you, at the green stage, you can pull them, snap them, and cook them like a regular green bean. If you let them get to about this stage actually, uh, they can be hauled out and used for a shell bean, a fresh shell bean. And then if you let them completely dry, which is the stage of most of these beans, we are at, this, at the point of uh, saving these for seed right now, they can be kept as a dry bean. So you have a long season on this bean, and they're easy to save the seeds from. Uh, this is a very productive uh, heirloom pole bean from eastern Kentucky. This is the one we use primarily for our, uh, our uh, preserving or canning bean. And um, so you can use uh, a bean similar to this, one that comes to mind. There's a lot of different varieties. You probably want to find one for your area. But if you've seen something like a cranberry bean, uh, and, they, and there's actually a cranberry bush bean, so if you don't want to fool with these trellises, uh, then you can use a bush variety of that, like a French horticulture or a dwarf French horticulture bean. Uh, those are similar. They can be used at the shell stage, uh, at the fresh stage and at the dry stage as well. So that's my primary recommendation for green beans, which is number two of the Dirty Dozen. The number three crop in the Dirty Dozen is the winter squash. Now that's different than the summer squash that you may be more familiar with, but winter squash are more nutritious. They have a longer storage potential. This is our favorite here, and it's almost at the harvest stage. This is Long Island cheese. It's a nice, um, fairly large uh, storage squash, has a great flavor, it's used in a variety of ways, and has that long-term storage potential that we'll be able to put this in um, cool, dry storage and be eating this until next spring. Now when the Native Americans were first using their varieties of squash, things have changed a little bit. Often they would dry their squash, so they would slice it thin and dry it and store it that way. You can still do that for varieties of squash, but uh, the, the varieties we have, especially like butternut or like this Long Island cheese, 
Seminole squash is one of our favorite long-term storage squashes. There's a small variety of that. There's a large variety of that. If you want something that really stores, you'll select that one. Uh, so we have the potential to have to grow lots of different squash that store well. You can also grow different types. If they're uh, a pumpkin, like a, a pie pumpkin, is different than a butternut type squash. So they can be grown side by side. You can save the seed from both of those types. So you can have a variety of squash, some that keep long, some that don't keep as long, so you use those first. The next crop in our dirty dozen is the garden pea. And it is late summer, so I unfortunately don't have a crop to show you growing in the ground, but that's the point. In the summertime, when we have green beans growing that we're using and storing uh, in the winter or the late uh, fall, early spring, we have peas that we're using because they're a cold weather crop. But remember, they're also a nitrogen fixer, a legume, so they're very important to add to the mix. The great thing about peas are there's a, a lot of variations in peas. So you can grow snow peas, you can grow sugar snap peas, uh, you can also grow the shell pea. And this is what we have here. These are shell pea seeds. And the good thing about these is that if you can't, you can freeze the other types, but this is good dry. So you can actually let those mature, let them dry out. They're easy to save those seeds from. And you can use these, rehydrate these, and cook these in the wintertime. So peas are a great versatile crop. The good thing about them is they're fairly self-pollinating, so you can grow all three types, snow, sugar snaps, and shell, in a, in a close area, and they're going to be pretty much true to type, so you can save those seeds and grow them year on. So peas is the legume that you need to grow at the front of the season, at the end of the season when, it start, when it's really cool, they do best then, and that gives you another legume to add to the mix. The next crop in our dirty dozen really helps us in those winter months, those early spring late fall months when there's not a lot to eat. And that is kale and other coal crops. Uh, these are crops that are very nutritious, they're fairly easy to grow, and they can help us during those times when there's not a lot of our main season crops in yet. Now there are a lot of different coal crops to grow, but I focus on kale uh, primarily because it's very nutritious and it's fairly easy to grow and save the seed from. If you have varieties that overwinter, most of the time in the spring, those will bolt and start to produce a flower, and then you can let those flower and save the seed for your next year's crop. So kale is a good one. I'm sort of leaning towards collards as well, especially if you live in parts of the south where collards can almost grow a year round, and they're a great survival crop and a great addition to the Dirty Dozen. If you ask about crops like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower, I grow those too. But they're not in our main list of the Dirty Dozen because they generally take a couple years to produce seed. So they're biannual. It's a little trickier to get seed from cabbage and things. So they, they fall down, further down the list in, in survival crops that you want to grow. Now those are detailed in the book, uh, but a summary is that if you want to grow these crops, that's great, but you probably want to store enough seed for several years because it at least, takes at least two years to produce seed from these. But a good strategy if you like cabbage, which is a great survival crop, which we grow a lot of, uh, is that you want to store uh, seed enough to last for three or four or five years. And that's easy to do. Cabbage seed lasts a long time. A crop that's overlooked often as a survival crop, but definitely makes our dirty dozen, is the sunflower. Now, sunflower is a very versatile crop that is easy to grow, and they look beautiful growing, right? So we can enjoy those. But what we can do is get several uses out of them. We can shell those seeds out, use them as edible human food. We can roast those, make a good snack. If we have a small scale home press, we can actually press those for oil and have an ed edible vegetable oil. Uh, we can use those as chicken feed. So if we have livestock or um, especially chickens integrated into the, the homestead, it's hard to grow good feed for those chickens. Sunflowers makes a good chicken feed as well. The great thing about sunflowers is you can start on them early. You can actually harvest them before those seeds become mature. Take that head and roast that head and eat those seeds before they're fully holed out and mature. So it's a really versatile crop. They're easy to store. All you have to do is to pull the heads off before the birds get them. The birds already started on this one. Uh, but take those seed heads. Oh, This is a mammoth variety. It has large seeds and heavy yields. So we want to get those before the birds do. 
knock off those flower remnants and hang this up somewhere to dry. If we need to cover the head with a brown paper bag or something to keep the birds off of it, we can do that. We can shell this out, we can store these well, and then we can eat these throughout the winter. So sunflowers is a very versatile crop, it doesn't need a lot of fertility. Uh, they do really well in our area and they're pretty to look at as well. After you're done, you have uh, a lot of biomass. So actually the sunflower stalks can make a good fuel. If you incorporate those back into the ground or compost them, they produce a lot of organic matter. So they're not too bad for the soil, so they add a lot of that and you get a great edible uh, crop. So sunflowers, definitely in our dirty dozen. Now while tomatoes don't have that many calories, uh, they are so versatile uh, nutritious and well loved that we have to add them to our dirty dozen. Now you can grow lots of different types of tomatoes and since they're self-pollinated I would recommend that. Cherry tomatoes are a great staple crop that are going to produce no matter what uh, and you can eat a lot of cherry tomatoes. You can sun dry those, preserve those, you can even can those or use them for sauces. Even though they're small they're going to be more disease, disease resistant. You're probably going to have good success with those. So I would always recommend adding varieties of cherry or salad tomatoes into your growing schedule. If you like slicers or paste tomatoes, add them as well. The paste tomatoes are very good for processing and if you want a few slicers thrown in there, uh, do that as well. Our last uh, crop of the year as far as tomatoes is a storage tomato crop. I think this one's called Golden Treasure. It may be Long Keeper. I think I have both. But this is our last uh, crop that we seed. And this is a storage tomato that will, uh, once it's almost ripe, uh, we will pull those and you can set those in, the, in a cool place in storage in the basement and they will continue just to sit there and slowly ripen but will hold for six to eight weeks. So this is the very last crop we grow and that really extends our uh, tomato season. Along with our processed tomatoes, tomatoes can be used almost year round. We start in the high tunnels in uh, April and then we have a crop generally by May or June of uh, fresh tomatoes and then we have those all the way up through normally December in our zone. So you can extend the season on tomatoes, have fresh tomatoes, uh, canned tomatoes, dried tomatoes a lot of the year. Here we are with our next member of the Dirty Dozen that gets often overlooked on survival gardening lists and that is okra. It is a very um, tough crop that produces slowly over time, especially in those droughty months of late summer. So if you're in our area or south, it definitely needs to be included on the list. Most of the objections come from people that just don't like okra, but we are talking about survival crops here. So, and it's actually a very versatile crop. You can fry it, and who doesn't like fried okra, right? But it's great in soups and curries as a thickener and it really helps uh, in those, in those uh, dishes like that if you don't have something else to add to it. So it's good added with stuff. Add it to your, your corn and your tomatoes. It makes a great dish with your onions. So it's very versatile. It's also one of those crops that pickles well. So we're not adding cucumbers to our dirty dozen. You can uh, check the book out to learn why. But if you want a pickled, you know, vinegary, fermented crop, okra fills that niche really well. Uh, so you can can that as a pickled uh, crop as well. You can also freeze it. You can dry it and it's easy to save the seed from. So just make sure you give yourself enough time at the end of the season to leave a few pods to go to seed, let them fully mature, and then you can have plenty of seed for the coming years. Uh, we have a variety here that we grow, that we've grown for several years. It's originally a cross between emerald and burgundy, but it's sort of our own variety that we like. Very productive. It's open pollinated, but uh, open pollinated uh, okra does fairly well. Hybrid seed is very expensive, but if you find a good uh, variety that's adapted to your area, it's going to be your late summer uh, crop that still produces a little bit every week. So you can harvest a little bit as you need it. So that's one of those dependable survival crops that I would add to every survival garden and definitely makes our dirty dozen. Now we're here in the greenhouse with our next two additions to our dirty dozen. We're going to treat these together because they're a little bit similar. Uh, these are onions and garlic. So we're in our storage phase now. So these were dug in the summertime and we're just using up the last of this uh, summer crop. Uh, garlic will be planted in the fall, so we're going to replant this in the ground. It's a very nutrient-dense crop that can actually be used year-round. So once we plant these in October, uh, actually anytime you need garlic, you can pull that fresh plant up and use it. We'll harvest this next summer, 
but uh, this hardneck variety will store through the winter until pretty much we run out of it. Sweet onions. Uh, sweet onions are a great crop to grow, uh, but there are lots of other types of onions. So you can start the season with green onions. Uh, you can use shallots. You can use these uh, sweet uh, onions for slicing. Then go into your storage onions. You can use potato onions, which are multiplier onions, uh, shallots, Welsh onions. We have Egyptian walking onions. There's, there's lots of variety of onions that you can use almost year round. They're cold hardy. So in our greenhouses and high tunnels in the winter, we like evergreen hardy, just a green onion. Uh, so onions are used almost in everything you cook. Uh, so you can uh, use them fresh, you can dry them, you can freeze them, or you can use them in live storage like this. So definitely onions, definitely garlic as the next two members of our Dirty Dozen. So far in the Dirty Dozen, we focused on our main season storage crops, but we really need something to bridge that gap in those winter months when there's nothing else growing fresh. Spinach is the crop to do that. Spinach is a member of our Dirty Dozen. Uh, it's more winter hardy than lettuces, so we can grow this year round almost. And if, especially with cover in the dead of winter, we're gonna have a nice, nutritious, fresh green to eat that is high in vitamins and will give us some variation in our diet when we're tired of all those storage crops. So spinach is definitely added to the list. It is late summer here, so we don't have spinach actively growing in the field. Uh, we just have some seeded for our first fall crop in trays. So here we are in our cool room looking at a portion of our storage crop of the next member of our Dirty Dozen. And it maybe should be the most uh, important member of our Dirty Dozen because as far as calories per square foot, nothing tops potatoes. So these are Irish potatoes. Uh, this is variety is Kennebec. This is one of our main season varieties that we use to store. Uh, potatoes uh, can be say you can save your seed year after year, but I would only do that maybe two or three years. They do build up viruses, so um, they're gonna the yield's gonna decrease over time. But it is one that you can definitely get a couple years out of. They store well just with some even low-tech in the ground storage. So you're going to be able to use these for a long season. Uh, you're going to be able to have lots of calories and nutrition from a small area. And that's one of the important things when we talk about survival crops and the Dirty Dozen. So potatoes definitely make the list. So if you've been keeping track, you know that this is actually number 13, right? So it's a true baker's dozen. Uh, sweet potatoes is definitely on our list. And I added this as 13 because in the south, uh, this is gonna be a primary crop. In the north, not really. So you need to choose one of those storage crops. Uh, sweet potatoes, if you're in the south. Uh, potatoes, you're probably gonna focus on more if you're in the north and can't grow sweet potatoes that well. Thankfully, we are in the, the mid-south where we can grow both successfully, and we do grow both. And if you can do that, I would recommend doing it as well. But sweet potatoes are one of those crops that's very nutritious and uh, you can actually eat the greens. Anytime you see a green, you can stir fry that, uh, cook that down and use that as a nutritious uh, edible green. Then of course the roots uh, store a long time as well. So you can store those in a fairly warm area too. They don't need cold storage, so a basement works fine for those. They store a little bit better in warmer temperatures and they'll last a complete year in good storage conditions if they're cured right. Now I, I just found a tuber not too long ago that was from last year's crop and it had still had sprouts that were coming out on it. I stuck that in soil and, and you can just produce your own plants every year, which is very important for a survival crop that you want to be uh, self-sufficient with. You want to be able to propagate that and continue to use that crop. And unlike uh, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes really don't build up viruses and such, so you can continue to propagate your own material year after year. So it's a great uh, crop for that reason. Definitely a, uh, a member of our Dirty Dozen plus one. You can also grow different varieties of sweet potato. This is Beauregard, and this is about a tenth of an acre plot. We've started harvesting. This is grown on biodegradable black plastic, so it gives them a jump, helps with weed control. Beauregard is a orange flesh sweet potato that we really like. We also like some of the white flesh or purple flesh Japanese sweet potatoes. They're a little drier, so they're great for baking, maybe for frying. So it's a little bit of variation on the sweet potato theme. So you can grow different varieties and kind of shake it up a little bit. But sweet potatoes is definitely one you want to add to the list. 
and this is a about a tenth of an acre we had about a thousand plants in here if that gives you some idea but it's going to produce a lot so you don't need nearly this much uh, but just a few uh, hills or beds of sweet potatoes will definitely set you in good stead while i was filming this video i thought it might be interesting to actually get some real world numbers on calories per square foot so while we were actively harvesting the corn the uh, sweet potatoes and the potatoes i calculated some yield data in order to see actually how many calories you're getting per square foot from a real world uh, crop so i have those numbers but it was too much to put in one video so i'm going to pull that out and make a separate video in the future so if you have subscribed to our channel hit your notification bell and when we do post new videos you will be aware of that now I know you guys can think of lots of different crops that you're going to want to grow in your garden and we do agree and we cover all those crops in my book The Complete Guide to Survival Gardening. Uh, it's available on Amazon and we'll put a link to that book in the description. But we want to focus on the Dirty Dozen today and we hope that you've learned something from this video as you plan your garden that's going to help your family uh, feed itself during difficult times. So if you've gained anything from this video give us a thumbs up and think about subscribing. The more subscribers we have the more videos we can make and the more content we can bring you. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.